Hello and welcome to the 2022 Global Impact Summit. We're in Africa today and I'm joined by Krista Davidson from Ingenie. Krista, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here, Patrick. Thanks for having me. This is like an annual conversation you and I have around the, the Africa EdTech Ed Tech 50. So it's wonderful to check in. I thought we should start just by learning a little bit more about yourself and about Ingenie and what it does and, and the work that you do. Sure. Yeah, I can, I'll start with a, a bit of an intro on myself and then, and then move into Ingenie and um, why we've positioned ourselves the way we have. So my name is Krista Davidson. I am originally from the US, but I've been living in South Africa for the last nearly six years. Um, I'm, I'm based in Cape Town, as is in Genie, and I've spent my career really working in the social impact space. Um, I've found quite a, a nice niche in, in combining social impact innovation and sort of um, now, obviously, over the last few years, education specifically. Um, I have always loved the tech startup space. I've founded a few companies in, in the past with variable success and <laughs> found that I would love to be on the other side of the table and support those entrepreneurs that are coming up with really, really interesting innovations to solve critical challenges across the continent and their, in their markets. Um, so I've worked in health tech, I've worked in mobility, I've worked in financial inclusion. Um, I found myself at Ingenie from about Early, early 2019, April 2019, I officially joined. Um, I've been leading the team since then. I'm, I'm now Ingenie's executive director. Um, I joined the board earlier this year, and uh, I'm really excited about sort of the direction that we've we've taken Ingenie over these these last few years. So maybe just to transition into Ingenie and and what we do. So Ingenie was founded as Africa's first ed tech incubator. Uh, we did a lot of really interesting work working with very early stage African ed tech entrepreneurs and, and solutions that were all in various ways trying to address accessibility, quality and relevance of education throughout the continent. Um, we supported those, those earlier companies through very sort of structured cohort approach programs. Um, we, we worked with them through, through mentorship and additional funding and, and other resources. And we kept them in our community and started building this, this really diverse ed tech ecosystem from, from across the continent. So after a few years of, of doing that sort of work um, and also just simulating the ecosystem with events and, and other sort of early stage interventions that were focusing on those who are just starting out in their business development journeys, we realized that the, the landscape, the ed tech landscape across the continent had matured. The, the market was sort of moving along with us. And of course, that was great to see. We were seeing some companies that had managed to get quite a bit of traction um, over those the, the course of the last few years. They've found a bit of product market fit and they really have built up their potential for impact so that they are really starting to see some, some real tangible outcomes, educational outcomes being improved in their, their target markets. So with that sort of observation and some of the learnings that we took from our early years of, of incubation, we really kind of transitioned from incubation to what we call acceleration. And we have our, our flagship program called uh, the Acceleration Partnership Program. And we really think about it as a partnership. So we think of ourselves as an extension of the teams that we're working with. Um, the key difference between our incubation, our previous incubation work and our acceleration work now is the way in which we are, we're engaging. So rather than having a really structured program, sort of to some extent a one size fits all kind of offering, we are really personalizing our approach and every company that comes into the program at the time that suits them best. So we're not necessarily um, saying that they must start the program on this date and finish on this date. Instead, they come in when it's, when it's right for them. We build a support program in alignment with their key needs and, and um, gaps within their existing business. Uh, we help them to achieve key milestones that we set together and we collaboratively work towards those milestones over the course of the partnership. So that partnership might be three months, it might be a year and a half. It really depends on the needs and the scope of the kind of support that we'll be providing. So we've now worked with about 12 companies in that capacity. We're about to, to bring on our 13th. Um, we have, have really enjoyed it. We've learned a lot over this time. 
uh, working with these these slightly more mature founders who've been around for a bit longer is a really interesting sort of difference. There's a really interesting difference there from our very early stage work. Um, but in both cases, you know, the teams are led by really passionate founders who are, are really, really serious about solving a problem or a challenge that they've faced or have seen their community face um, across the continent. So really great success so far. Um, I think I'll lastly just mention that we do have two other areas of work. So we still are active in the ecosystem development space, meaning we still host events, we still bring those early stage innovators together, it's really important that we have some mechanism to support them, to feed into the pipeline, to make sure that we continue to have these innovations that mature and are able to, to make the impact that we know these, these sort of homegrown entrepreneurial ventures can, can bring to their markets. Um, and then we also have the Ingenie Think Tank, which is our research and advisory arm. So Patrick, we've worked with Colin IQ in that capacity in the past. Um, our, our researchers are really looking at education innovation across the African continent. We're not exclusively focused on ed tech in that space. Um, we're looking at everything from early childhood to post-secondary and, and sort of everything in between um, and really just trying to understand a bit more about the landscape, making sure that we can provide the entrepreneurs that we're supporting with, with market research that's going to help them make evidence-based decisions um, and really just sort of bringing a bit more attention to what's happening in the ecosystem to bring in more investment and, and other sort of um, resources from the international audience that is looking to Africa and, and seeing where they can support. So I'll pause there. That's awesome. I don't know questions. Very cool. No, it's great. It's great to be. It's great to to hear how much the continent has grown with Ingini and Ingini has grown with the continent and go through that 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 story of starting to support the continent at such an early stage and now growing to the point and building those capabilities that you're supporting teams on a as needs basis and finding the right fit as well for sure and the one size fits all comment I think is a great one too because I suspect that as the continent and edtech starts to mature as well some of those problems become more unique or the opportunities mm -hmm. as well just remind me like when you say Africa um, how far north uh, um, is in, is in Gini focused? Yeah, so we're we're focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I yeah. think the the sort of differences between North and and sub-Saharan are a bit too stark for us to be able to tackle them all. Um, yeah, we do have some programs that are very specifically focused on Southern Africa or South Africa, just being that we are based here. Um, but yeah, we we are very much open to supporting companies yeah. that are operating throughout the sub-Saharan region. Are there any, like, what is the geographic diversity as well of the teams that are in the partnership program right now, as well as the incubator? Yeah, so across both the incubator and the accelerator, we have representation from, from 10 different African countries. So everywhere from mm -hmm. Sierra Leone and, and South Sudan to the more sort of um, mature markets like Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa. Um, so we, we've seen quite a lot. We are, have seen lots of really innovative solutions that are, are operating in various markets. So they might be based in, for instance, Nigeria, but with a full sort of West African footprint and, and active throughout the region. Um, within our acceleration partnership program, we are only actually sort of by, um, by chance, we're only supporting companies that are in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa right now. Um, that hasn't been super yeah. intentional. It's just been where the, the opportunities yeah. have have come um, because those markets are a bit more mature, I think. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. And maybe moving over to the market because you've been focused for a number of years now and, and in Gini for, for quite some time. What, what are you finding is unique about the Africa market? And remembering that there's probably... Africa experts joining us right now and also Africa beginners too. So, you know, what, what is it that you're finding and reflecting on is actually unique about, about the Africa education and education to context? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's firstly, it's extremely diverse across the continent, across the sub-Saharan yeah. region. It's, it's going to be very different in, in each country and in some cases, each province or state or even town, um, you know, if, if I focus in on South Africa, for instance, the most of the education sector is really sort of 
controlled by the provincial education department. Mm -hmm. So the national department of education obviously has a big say in sort of how budgets should be spent, but um, in terms of implementation that's happening on a provincial and a district level. So from each of these geographic areas, you see sort of differences in, in how education is actually playing out for, for children on the ground. Um, I think what's, you know, be, beyond the diversity, which is obviously quite sort of unique to our continent and our context, I think um, there is this sort of, this unfortunate challenge that is facing the sector in its, its sort of human resources um, deficiency. So I think the sort of teacher shortage is, is very well publicized. There's something like 15 million teachers are needed to be recruited and trained and placed by 2030 in order to come close to re reaching the, the United Nations um, SDG4 on quality education, meeting any of those sort of goals. We're obviously very far off from that and not looking like we will meet that, that target. Um, so I think therein lies this opportunity for ed tech innovators to bring to market these solutions that are specifically trying to make the, the teaching profession a bit more appealing. Um, you know, you can only do so much in the private sector because education is so wrapped up with, mm -hmm. with public sector activity. Um, yeah. But I think there, there is this opportunity to ensure that teachers are getting the support that they, they need um, and hopefully making things a bit less overwhelming for them. They're already in most places on the continent. They're far underpaid. They're not valued as, as they should be as vital, critical members of our communities. Um, and so, I mean, that hopefully changes over time with, with changes in budget allocations and um, better sort of management in, in some regards. But yeah. in the meantime, I think there is this, this opportunity to get them resources now to help them to really sort of make their job easier in the classroom. They're spending, they can spend less time on administration, less time um, marking exams and a lot more time actually teaching, actually educating and, and working with children on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I think the shortage is obviously it's, it's dire. It's something that we need to address at a large scale, but there are opportunities to sort of close that gap in the meantime and, and help to make sure that the teachers that are there are getting support that they need um, and hopefully attracting more teachers to the profession who will ultimately be sort of prepared to bring their all and mm. get that kind of support in return. How about, how about COVID? Because I suspect that, you know, learning loss was still very significant, but some parts of the world turn to turn to digital, which, mm -hmm. you know, I hazard a guess Africa as a continent doesn't have the same access as other parts of the world either. How, how is everyone thinking, you know, in a, you know, COVID learning loss um, world about, about what happened and the learning loss and about, mm -hmm. you know, online, whether that's kind of K-12 or higher ed? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I think a lot of people globally sort of thought, okay, if we get these digital products out there, we'll solve for access yeah. and people will continue learning. And we saw almost sort of unanimously across the world that that didn't really happen in the way that we hoped. Yeah. Um, Africa is no different. We, we did also try to adopt digital solutions. And as you yeah. mentioned, it's infrastructure doesn't necessarily allow for wide rollouts of really sort of high tech solutions. Um, yeah. But I mean, emergency teaching methods were, were immediately sort of turned to. So go, moving to WhatsApp, to ensure that lesson plans were going out, that children yeah. were receiving the curriculum that they, they needed. And of course, it's not the ideal solution and there's not a whole lot of yeah. interactivity um, involved in, in, in that kind of um, working solution, but, but it's something. Um, I think what was really missing in our context was not just actually access. I think we could get those materials out. It was about inclusion mm -hmm. and ensuring that okay, just because the information's there doesn't mean we've sort of thought about how that end user, that learner is going to be able to engage with it and stay engaged. And, and how are they meant to support their families? For, if we're thinking of sort of like older children in the school system, how are they meant to 
focus on their own education while also trying to help their their families with domestic chores or bringing in additional income. You know, there, there are so many factors mm-hmm. that weren't really considered. Um, a child at home does not mean the child is learning at home um, in the same way that you or I yeah. sitting at home in front of a, a, a an online course does not necessarily mean that we are yeah. engaging and really, really comprehending and taking that in. So I think there was, there was this key sort of factor that was missing around ensuring that engagement was actually taking place, monitoring those learning outcomes in, in one way or another. So, you know, I think we only really found out, and I mean, to some extent, we're, we're still finding out what the extent of that learning loss actually was once the kids got back to school and schools opened up again. Um, there was no yeah. way to sort of like track along along those, over those two years, essentially, that we were um, dealing with such disruptive circumstances. So yeah, there was a lot to be desired. Um, I think we we are seeing solutions that are and have been really focusing on closing that gap. Um, An example Mm -hmm. locally in South Africa is Reflective Learning that focuses Mm -hmm. on closing sort of, they've traditionally focused on maths, but they've actually moved into English more recently. Um, but really sort of bridging those conceptual shortfalls and catching up students with really personalized um, plans to help them to to sort of get to where they're meant to be in terms of their grade level competencies. So, I mean, they have, they've seen really amazing results because they've utilized adaptive learning and have, have really um, made their product super data driven. So they've understood how a learner can go back to the basics and sort of yeah. get to where they need to be. Um, so more solutions like that, the sort of wider the and more accessible and more inclusive those solutions can be, the better. Um, and hopefully we we see change over time. I think it's, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're still figuring it out. I think we're still sort of quite fresh out of COVID, despite how yeah. people <laughs> wanted to jump right into normal life again. I think we're still we're still seeing a lot of the yeah. effects come out and, and will for, yeah. for the many years to come. Fascinating. Um, as you, you know, as we come out of COVID, but also over the last few years, what type of patterns are you seeing on the solution side? Like where, um, what's, what's a typical kind of cluster of, of, of ed tech solutions like in, in sub-Saharan Africa? Like what are the categories that are getting traction and you're seeing yeah. time after time? Yeah, I think, I mean, earlier on, I sort of alluded to the need for teacher training and support solutions. I think we have seen a big, a pretty big uptick of, of those. Um, so that can sort of be wrapped in, in some cases can be wrapped into learning management systems where we're you know, try, taking that admin, the administrative burden away from teachers and school administrators and allowing them to focus on what matters most. Um, so I think we've seen a lot, of, a lot of those and I think we will continue seeing a lot of those in different, different sort of um, versions of, of that kind of solution coming out. Um, we've also seen a lot of tutoring solutions. I think that's, Mm. um, you know, it's interesting, particularly in our market because private tutoring is generally not going to be very affordable to to most families in, in our sort of African, um, pan-African context. And so with that, you know, coming up with these solutions that are a bit more affordable, a bit more accessible, I think is really a, a big win. If, um, for instance, there's an organization called Watobi that we are supporting. It's also a South African company. Um, they're trying to really figure out economies of scale and get their really high quality tutoring sessions down to something like 40 rand per session per hour which is a, yeah. a really, really good rate. I don't know the conversion off the yeah. top of my head, but, um, but it's very, yeah. very affordable compared to what you would see sort of in a one-on-one live tutoring session would be, you know, at least 250, 300 rand per, per session. So, wow. um, so it's, a, it's a big savings. Obviously it's, you know, you're having to make some sacrifices because you don't have that one-on-one um, in-person sort of session, but you know, I, th- I think it's, if it's that or nothing, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to be exploring yeah. what it looks like to, to be taking those solutions at scale and, and trying to make sure that everyone has some sort of alternative to supplement their, their education in particularly public sector schools that might not be 
very well resourced, um, might not have a teacher with very sort of solid qualifications or training to really guide you as, as a learner. Um, so anything we can do to support the rollout of more solutions like that, I think is, is really, yeah. really good. Um, yeah, I think others- What about, are, um, what about text skills? Sorry, yeah, I was actually just about to, to touch on that. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> so I think, yeah, tech skills, um, we have seen quite a bit of sort of like developer support tools, the developer trainer training tools, um, various quote unquote 4IR um, solutions that are trying to equip people for the future of work. Um, you know, what, what exactly the future of work means, I think is sort of um, up for interpretation in, in different sort of contexts. People think of it in different ways. In our context, I think, you know, digital literacy is extremely important. I don't think anyone in, in sort of the next 10 years should be in a position where they don't know how to operate a, a standard computer. Um, so I think we can sort of scale back some of our digital, um, training tools to the basics and that can still be really beneficial like ensuring that someone has the know-how to do administrative work and um, sort of project planning on a computer is just as important if not more for sort of the the um, sort of the average mm -hmm. um, sub-saharan african individual as you know learning how to code in python and and being able to to yeah. work in that sort of space yeah. you know it's, they're very different I, obviously there's a need for both um and there are a lot of really brilliant innovators and individuals who are going on to be, excel in in various sort of sub segments of the technology um ecosystem and that's great but i think right now the focus of our sort of ed tech ecosystem shouldn't necessarily be on robotics and um, sort of these these very yeah. sort of, you know, nice to haves. <laughs> we need to focus yeah. on what yeah. most people in the population are going to be able to benefit from. And I think that's the more basic yeah. digital literacy, like let's get people marketable and, and able to contribute to an inclusive digital society going forward. Love it, that's wonderful. Um, second last question for you is, you know, they're some of the areas you've seen a lot of. What are some of the areas that you haven't seen as many solutions for, but are still kind of in, in high need spaces or spaces that you'd like to see more, more activity and more, more people attacking? Mm. Yeah, I think we, I'm really personally very passionate about early childhood education. Um, you know, it's a difficult one yeah. because like how much do we want to expose very young children to technology? It's, you know, I think net negative in a lot of cases to be putting a tablet in front of a three-year-old, mm -hmm. but there are other ways to incorporate innovation and technology into the early childhood sort of development space. Um, we've seen a few really interesting examples of, of companies that are, for instance, focusing on the business owners, the entrepreneurs who are building up these pre-primary sort of education facilities, community-led um, creches is, is sort of how we, we talk about them in South Africa or um, other sort of ECD centers across the continent. So empowering mostly the women who are leading those organizations to be better equipped to not only teach the children, but to understand their nutritional needs, to run a business that is going to make sense in their context to think about how they should be collecting fees and empowering them and, and really enabling them with the right kind of financial tools that ultimately help them deliver better educational content, allow them to sort of support themselves and their families and ultimately their communities and the children that are accessing their centers. So there's a really amazing organization that we're working with called Tiny Totos in Kenya. They're very much focusing on East Africa. Um, we've seen quite a few others that are operating in other places in the on the continent. Um, there's a, a, a sort of on another note, but still in the ECD space, an organization called Trachosaurus that is focusing on formative assessments for early childhood um, ch children. So, so between sort of 
I'm going to get the ages wrong here, I think, but <laughs> under sort of eight years old, um, they are developing games that really are just games. So a child can play on a tablet for 10 or 20 minutes mm -hmm. and it gives the, the teacher a chance to interact with the other children, to focus on them. Yeah. They get the tablet back and they get to see some really interesting insights about that child's cognitive development and sort of where they are and hitting their formative milestones. So that sort of intervention is also really interesting. I think there's an opportunity to do more things like either of those solutions um, across the continent and really getting these out there to ensure that we are as a society focusing on early childhood. I think there's, there's still, um, at least if I'm speaking about the sort of South African context, in many communities, it's a cultural norm to just have a family member, you know, sort of deal with your young yeah. child while you're, you're at work. And that's partly an affordability issue, but partly just because that is sort of mm -hmm. cultural norm. Um, and so if we can empower even those child care, those, those caregivers with sort of the right kind of content to be working with that child to, to help them develop and, and sort of get the best start possible, then let's, let's try and do that. So more, more work in the ECD space, I think is really, really pivotal, yeah. really, really vital. Um, unfortunately, it's a very long game to see the real impact yeah. there. It's, it's so important that we get it right. Phenomenal. Um, okay, last question is is what's on the horizon for Ingini, whether that's either events or what's coming up next year or what should we expect to see from Ingini in the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so I think in terms of an immediate um, sort of uh, opportunity to, to sort of engage with us, we are, are looking to have our African EdTech week coming up actually in late November. So awesome. hopefully we'll be sharing some more news about that and, and there will be ways for partners and, and others to get involved um, to sort of see some of these, these companies that I've been talking about, see some of their work showcased um, and find opportunities yeah. to work with them. Um, yeah, next year we have a few really exciting programs on the, on the horizon. I can't give too much away just yet, but um, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to launching some really new, some new interventions with some really amazing partners and um, an opportunity to work with a lot more inspiring innovators in this space. So yeah, so keep, cool. keep an eye on us. Um, people can, can check out our website, can join our mailing list to follow along. Awesome. That's so wonderful. Sounds like I will definitely be attending uh, Africa Ed Tech Weeks. Sounds fascinating. And Krista, um, congratulations to you and the team again on everything that you do for the for the ed tech ecosystem on the continent. You're just going from stride to stride every time we catch up. There's a another new exciting initiative or some some outcomes. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a little bit more about Ingini. Thanks so much, Patrick. This has been great. Thanks, Krista.